Hi everybody, thank you for joining us today for our webinar. Um, we are just getting set up just now um, and we're just waiting for people to join the call. Um, so what we'll do is we'll maybe just give it a couple minutes um, just to see if we've got um, a good number of people on the call with us today. Um, also just to say the session is being recorded um, so the recording of this webinar will be uploaded to the Scottish Wildlife Trust's YouTube channel. So if for any reason you have to nip away, um, then you can always watch it back at your leisure afterwards. It will be uploaded a few days after the session. But for now, just make sure you've got a cup of tea, make sure you've got a comfy seat. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us. We're really looking forward to talking with you today about some of the really exciting work going on um, around squid and ocean invertebrates. For those of you who are maybe less familiar with Zoom, we can point out a few useful pointers um, along your toolbar. Um, so you will notice that there is a Q&A box. Um, please use this box to pop in any questions that you might have for the speakers at any point. And um, what we'll do is at the very end of the session, once everyone's spoken, we will do a big group Q&A to hopefully work through those questions. Um, but please do add them in as we go and indicate if your question is for a particular individual or if it's for everybody as well. You'll also notice that there are the reaction tab is up there. So feel free to use that if you'd like to give a thumbs up or anything at all, an applause. Um, there's also a chat box. Please use the chat box to um, share any comments and discussions as we go. Um, and just one thing about the chat box, we would just kindly ask you not to share any web links in the chat box. And please don't open any web links that haven't been shared by one of the speakers you can see today. And um, this is purely just a digital safeguarding point. Um, and the last thing is captions. So if it helps you to have a live transcript of what's being spoken um, in this session, then you can enable live captions. Um, so you'll see CC and you can just select that. And if that helps you, please do turn it on. If not, feel free to leave it off. Okay, so... Looking at our numbers just now and looking at time, I think what we might do is we might push on just now. If anyone does join us during the session, then um, we can always do a bit of catch up. Um, so yeah, I think first off, just to say thank you very much again for joining us for this session today. Um, this is a, a webinar as part of a wider series um, that's being run by the Scottish Wildlife Trust, but we've got lots of really fantastic partners who are really supporting this webinar series to talk about their work and some of the really exciting things going on around Scotland and further afield as well, as you'll learn today in this session. So my name is Eloise, I'm with the Scottish Wildlife Trust. You can see here we have our speakers. We have Graham, we have Sankri, we have Anne-Marie, and we have Jessica as well. And um, so you won't want to hear from me any longer. You're not here to listen to me. Um, so I'm going to kindly hand over um, to Graham. Before we do that, though, what I would like to do is ask you guys a question. So we are going to pop a poll question um, here. And hopefully you can see this. Oh, it's not loaded correctly. Hang on a second. Um, hmm. Sorry, excuse me for the technical issues. Um, okay, we have a poll question for you, but for some reason it wasn't popping up correctly. So um, what we'll do is we'll revisit the poll question later on, all right? Um, it's one that we can definitely have after Graham's talk rather than before. So Graham, if you would be happy to take the floor and uh, give us a talk about the Ceps for Chef project. Right, thanks very much. Just give me a second while I try and share my screen and let's hope this works. Right, so are, are, are you seeing my screen? 
Are oh, you seeing a picture of a squid? I yes. Can see some, okay, that that that's good. So, that this is largely a, about a, <clears throat> a recent European project, the Kefs and Chefs project. But there's a bit of background material in here about squid as well. Um, I should say that Anne Marie was the coordinator of this project. I was one of the participants, but we've put this talk uh, together between us. So without uh, further ado, I'll, I'll move on through it. So I should say before I get in, into talking about squid, that squid are just one of various different kinds of, of cephalopods, some of which, possibly all of which are already familiar to you. Um, we have squid, we have cuttlefish, we have octopus. Um, we also have the nautilus. And the, the picture at, at the top right there is, is one of the larger examples of, of the squid, um, a giant squid which was uh, stranded in, in Spain in this case. I suppose another way of looking at cephalopod diversity is the fact that they are a, a source of human food hence this slide, and hence also the Kess and Chefs project. So just turning to, to squid and, and focusing in on um, the, uh, the North Sea, Celtic Sea and English Channel area, so the area around the UK and Ireland, we've got a number of squid species, but probably the, the most important commercially are the ones you can see here. Um, Ilex coendetii is a short fin squid. Um, which you can probably see from the, the fins at the back of the animal. Alatoothis is the smallest of, of, of these species. It is a, a long fin squid, although it's not terribly obvious from this picture. And then you, you've got the two larger long fin squid, Loligo fabaceae and Loligo vulgaris, which are really quite hard to tell apart. And in fact, we had some discussion about these photos as to which was which, but generally, the characteristic which most easily distinguishes them is the the, the shape of, or, and size of the suckers on, on the, the tentacle clubs, which are just shown in, in this inset here. And Loligo vulgaris is, is the one which has two rows of very large suckers and two rows of small suckers, whereas in Loligo fabaceae, the, the suckers are of similar size. So just thinking about squid as a resource, I guess one question is, is squid fishing sustainable? Can it be sustainable? Um, there's probably good reasons why it should be. Um, these animals are, are fast growing. They have quite flexible life cycles. There's quite a lot of variability in the time of breeding. And this makes them resilient um, to overfishing and probably also resilient against unsuitable environmental conditions. And like most cephalopods, squid are generally seen as, as pioneer species, in other words, species which will come in and, and take over if, for example, fin fish are, are overfished. On the other hand, there are animals which breed only once before they die. And at, at least in the EU and in the UK, there are no catch limits. Um, they're not quota species under the, co the common fisheries policy, for example. So just moving along to, to provide a bit of broader context, the, the graph on, on the left shows us fishery landings of cephalopods as recorded by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the FAO. And you can see that since 1950, there's been a fairly steady growth in cephalopod uh, landings and mostly driven at a global level by increased catches of squid. If we turn to the right hand side, which is the Northeast Atlantic, um, I'll just introduce my cat here. <laughs> Turning to the Northeast Atlantic, we, we can see a slightly different picture in that there hasn't been such an, an obvious increase over, over the time period shown here. And squid are probably currently less important than cuttlefish and octopus at the European level. Just zooming in a, a little bit more, 
And, and this is looking at the, the long fin squid, the Loliginid squid, and, and the landings recorded in the Northeast Atlantic region. And this is information which comes from the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea and its working group on cephalopods. And you can see in this picture that landings have fluctuated without any clear trend over the, the last 20 years or so. Um, you can see that, that there's possibly different trends in different areas, but overall it looks more cyclic than showing any kind of trend. So <clears throat> just looking at, at some, the sources of data very quickly, um, this is information at the top from, from fisheries and information at the bottom from surveys. Um, fishery surveys allow us to look in a bit more detail because we can get information on which species was caught. In commercial landings, loliginid squid um, tend to be recorded as loliginid squid and some, sometimes simply as squid, which makes it hard to uh, identify the trends. And I think the message from this slide is, is really that in some areas, squid abundance appears to be going up, and in other areas, it appears to be going down. And there are some differences between the, the three main loligated species. And just before I move on to the Kess and Chefs project itself, um, one of the, the things which made us think about this project was the difference in the way cephalopods are seen in different parts of Europe, and in particular in the south. Cephalopods are a really important food source. Um, in Spain, where I live currently, there are fiestas de calamar, squid parties, octopus parties, cuttlefish parties, and the same sort of thing is seen in, in Portugal. And once we come to the north, I think that's something which is still to come. Certainly nowadays, you can go to fish shops and, and see squid, because squid on the counter there are from Granite City Fish in Aberdeen. But I think we've still got a long way to go before we get to the Southern European position. So the Kess and Chefs project produced a number of different outputs, um, looking at market opportunities, um, looking at uh, possible <coughs> government policy, um, looking at how you make cephalopod fisheries sustainable, and also producing a recipe book. And you can find all of these on the Kefs and Chefs website. And I just want to show you a few pages out of the policy brief. So we looked at what we described as 10 important current issues affecting cephalopods and what the possible solutions are. Now, I'm not going to show you all of them because I don't have time, but I just want to go through a few of them quickly. One of the things which you may have gathered from the, the, the previous um, slides about squid abundance is that there are natural highs and lows in abundance. They are naturally very variable. And this makes it quite difficult to work out how good a, a fishery season is going to be. And one possible approach to solve this has been developing forecasting methods. I don't have an example for squid, but the example here is for octopus in the, in the Gulf of Cadiz in the south of Spain, where we've seen that the, the annual catch can be related in part to the strength of recruitment, which can, can be determined by surveys, but also um, it's related to rainfall. And in years with, with more rainfall, you, you get less octopus. And this is probably <clears throat> because of lower salinity due to more runoff from rivers. A general problem with, with fishery landings in Europe is that the catch isn't identified to species. As I mentioned before, in, in the case of Loniginids, um, sometimes they're landed as Loniginid squid, sometimes they're landed as squid, sometimes they're landed as as unidentified cephalopods, and, and that, that is an issue when you're trying to work out the status of, of any particular population. And indeed, th there's a related problem, is that you not only need to know the species, you need to know which population it comes from. And so we're, we're interested in how many different populations there are, for example, of Loligophobaceae. And we do have a partial answer 
um, to that question, at least for Lodigo for Basie. Um, before I get there, there's a, a small aside here. Um, squid, although they're soft bodied, do have various hard parts um, like the mandibles or beaks, the pen, and the staphyliths, um, which are ear stones equivalent to the otoliths of fish. And the shape of the staphyliths is one of the things which allows us to distinguish different populations, which now gets me back to the story. If we look at um, the squid Lodigophobaceae from different areas uh, around the, the European Atlantic, we can see some differences. And genetically, squid which were caught at Rockall seem to be reasonably distinct from other areas. Now, Rockall is a small area. These animals are probably vulnerable because there's a targeted fishery. Um, we can also see differences in staphylith shape um, in squid from different areas. Now, probably these aren't really separate populations because they could interbreed, but it does imply there, there are ecological differences between squid in, in, in different parts of their range. So going quickly through some of the other issues, squid fishing, Keftpod fishing generally does have some environmental impact. And curiously, um, one of the problems which arises has to, has to do with the eggs. If we look at cuttlefish, cuttlefish in, in the English Channel are, are often caught in traps and cuttlefish lay their eggs in the traps. So by catching a cuttlefish, we are also removing their eggs from the sea. So one possible solution, which was developed in the Med Mediterranean, was to put ropes inside the, the traps so that the cuttlefish would lay their eggs on the ropes, which could be removed before the traps were lifted so that the eggs survived. Although cephalopods are definitely a, a nutritious food, um, being protein rich, there is possibly a, a downside in that they can uh, uh, accumulate uh, metals, um, notably things like mercury and cadmium. Um, generally, the, the data we have suggests that virtually every part of the animal is safe to eat, but the liver or digestive gland does tend to uh, accumulate um, larger amounts of, of metals and, and maybe should be avoided, although certainly in some parts of the world, squid livers are eaten. And I think that brings me to the end. I've gone a little bit over my 10 minutes, but I hope I've given you a, a, a very quick flavor of, of, of what the Kefs and Chefs project did and told you a little bit about squid. So thank you. Thanks very much, Graham. Yeah, no, definitely all very interesting. And don't you worry, we can definitely make up time um, as we go. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So moving on swiftly then to our next speaker. So um, we'd like to introduce you to Sankri, um, who works for National Museum Scotland. Um, we've got, we actually did have a poll question that we wanted to try with you guys. What we'll do is we'll try our next question and we'll revisit the first question towards the end, if that's all right. Um, so let's have a look and see if the poll wants to play ball with us. Um, here we go. OK. So hopefully you can see this here on your screen. So we're asking a question about museum specimens. So good, I'm getting a thumbs up, that's great. So how many invertebrate specimens do you think National Museum Scotland look after? Um, so we have 600, 6,000, 60,000, or 6 million. So how many do you think they look after? Um, we we'll, can see the bars are still moving, so we'll just give you a wee minute to, to pop your answer down. Here we go, right. Ooh. I was just about to say it stopped. It's still moving. Give it another another few seconds. Okay, great. It looks like it stopped. So I'm going to end the poll there and you can see the results. So I wonder, Sankri, if we can hand over to you. Um, how do you feel about those results? Wow. Um, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll get to this. Um, just hold on a minute and I shall just share my screen with you. Um, Most people think 60,000, so let's see if we can prove them right or wrong. 
Right, can you all see my screen? We can, yes. You can. Thank you. Grand, okay. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for the talk, Graham. Um, I'm going to uh, gallop through this because it's quite hard to talk about as much as we need to talk about in, in one go. Um, going to very briefly sort of cover what the collections comprise with the background, why we have collections. Um, to start off with, I guess the background of it all is that the museum as we know it now, it started off as an industrial museum in 1854, um, but the museum building that we know now, the, the cornerstone was laid in, in 1861, um, but for the most important for us is that the natural history collections came from the University of Edinburgh in 1865, and that is indeed the basis of the natural history collections. So within the museum, there are a number of collections departments, natural sciences is, is the biggest of these ones, but you can see that there's quite a lot of other people involved too. Ah, so this is our number, 6 million specimens for invertebrate biology, everyone, 6 million. Um, this is way bigger than any of the other um, departments, collections, groups uh, in the museum. So within natural sciences, uh, invertebrate biology have 6 million specimens. Of that, uh, 2 million are entomological, so that is the insects, and uh, 4 million uh, are the rest of the invertebrates. If you added all of the museum collections together, um, it wouldn't touch the 6 million that we have in invertebrates. And that 6 million doesn't include things like microscope slides, scanning electron microscope stubs, um, there's a few other things like that as well. So the collections themselves, the, the specimens are collected from marine, freshwater and terrestrial environments uh, worldwide. Uh, but now we do focus on UK and Scottish waters and the Atlantic margin. Uh, most of our modern collections are preserved in, in alcohol in a, uh, in a building which, well, the room itself is uh, climate controlled to try and reduce the evaporation rates. The, there are uh, vents in the side of the room which open up if the alcohol uh, concentration gets too high and the roof is designed to blow off in the event of an explosion uh, rather than flattening the building, which I'm sure makes all the rest of our colleagues uh, happier. Uh, the, the collections themselves are uh, in taxonomic order from foraminifera to hemichordates. So you're looking at things like the sponges, anemones, hydroids, polychaetes, crustaceans, mollusks, echinoderms, tunicates. Um, so a lot of the time I get, oh no, going back a little bit, historically significant invertebrate collections. The, the basis of the collection that came from the, uh, mu the University of Edinburgh was the Dufresne collection, which originally belonged to uh, Napoleon's wife, Josephine. As she fell out of favour, uh, she could no longer afford to look after this collection. And Louis Dufresne, who was her conservator, put so much money in that he ended up owning it. And he then ended up selling it to the University of Edinburgh at what was a large price at the time. Um, running through a few more interesting uh, historical collections, um, HMS Rattlesnake of Thomas Henry Huxley, um, the Challenger Expedition in 1872 to 1876, which circumnavigated the, the world, and also gave a whole new view of, of what was underneath the, the, the surface of the ocean. Um, we also hold Blaschka models, you see some examples in the top of my screen there. Um, they were produced by Leopold and Rudolf Blaschke in Dresden in Germany. Um, most importantly for us, our, our, our scientifically most important uh, specimens are from the Scottish National Antarctic Expedition uh, led by William Spears Bruce. Um, we have a number of specimens new, that were new to science when they came back, that came from that collection. I get asked a lot why we have collections. Well, natural history collections contain centuries worth of data, um, the largest single source of information about what lives where and when. We answer questions like, what sort of animal is it? Um, we get information about the environment from uh, specimens. We can get information about changes in species range over time. 
And in some specimens, if you're lucky enough to have a parasite, it's two for the price of one because you get that much extra information with it. The question of what type of animal it is, it sounds like a really basic question, but actually it's not quite as simple as that. Um, you look at the, the elephant there, most people will say, yes, it's an elephant, and a fair few of you can probably tell me that it's uh, an Indian elephant. And that's fine, you can say that from a picture, but sometimes it's not quite as simple as that. Um, sometimes you need to have more detailed studies of the anatomy, you might need to look at the DNA, you might need to have tissue samples. Um, something that's very small. Actually, do you know what? You might need a microscope. It's not going to be enough to say, oh, I saw this thing um, in the sea. Uh, this is uh, some study that I did um, that was funded by Nature Scott a good decade or so ago. It was looking at the morphology versus the molecular features of a group of closely related uh, mud snails. So the physical characteristics are the tentacle banding, the, sort of the patterns that go there. So a v, uh, an inverted V on that species and a band on that. And you also need to look at penis shape. Uh, and we compared it to the, the molecular um, barcoding. And the, what we got from that was actually that looking at the morphology isn't necessarily enough um, to tell you what the species is. Sometimes you get specimens that have intermediate features. So I have uh, a specimen here that's got uh, one tentacle of one species and one tentacle that you would associate with another species. Um, besides which these specimens, well, no, this, these, these species, they are, uh, there are, there's lots of phenotypic variation. So in an environment, it could change actually what the shells themselves look like as well. So it's really useful to have the specimens that you can actually go and do the molecular work on and, and sort of solve these sort of questions. So what happens when you have an animal that's new to science? Um, it has to be examined, that it's new has to be confirmed. It needs, oh, I'm going backwards forwards. Um, it needs to be named, it needs to be described. Uh, then the reference specimen or series of specimens referred to in the publication are then deposited in the museum. These are called type specimens and are our most valuable um, specimens. When another new species is found that is related, it would be compared to the type specimens that are already deposited that are, are similar uh, species. This particular one was found off St Kilda in 2009. It's quite sizable. It just goes to show that we still have interesting things that are new uh, in, our, in our own seas. Uh, quickly moving on, another example of how you can get data from collections. This is a large clam called Arctica Icelandica. They're very long lived. They can live for up to 450 years. Well, that's the oldest we know of. If you take a cross section of the shell and you look at the, the growth bands in detail, you can get environmental data for when that growth band was laid down, things like um, oxygen concentrations and sea surface uh, temperatures, or not sea surface, sea temperatures. Uh, so one of these could actually give you 450 years worth of data. Um, it's just incredible. Uh, another example of information, uh, this is a collection of specimens that were collected by Scottish Association for Marine Science um, over 20 years in the Rockwell Trough and the Hebridean Slope. Um, some of these were sent away. Um, these are brittle stars and the resulting publication showed that actually uh, specimens, well, plastics were going to the deep sea and being ingested by animals as early as the 1970s, which is actually really scary. But this example of going back in and answering questions that are sort of behind us in time. Galloping on to all the people we have collaborations with and, can, and collections with, um, they include JNCC, um, a consortium of offshore operators that we called that were called AFN um, in collaboration with the Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, Nature Scott, um, this is fate voucher collections from baseline and monitoring surveys of uh, 
special areas of conservation and, and sites of special scientific interest. Uh, strategic environmental assessments, um, NERC productivity program. Um, in 2019, my colleague Fiona Ware went on a marine survey Scotland of the continental shelf and brought back more specimens there. Um, oops, backwards again. Um, CEPA, universities, environmental consultancies. Um, we are still accepting collections with good data and make these collections available for current and future research. If any of you would like to donate to the collections um, or use them indeed, please contact me. These are my contact details. And finishing off the squid theme, I leave you with an image of the club of the giant squid found off the East Lothian coast in 1917 and published by James Ritchie as the only definite occurrence of giant squid, Architeuthis, from the coast of Great Britain. Thank you. Wow, what a way to end the talk. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much, thank you. It's so interesting. Um, great. So for the sake of time, what we'll do is we'll um, see if we can squeeze in a wee poll question, actually. We've not had one in a while. Um, what I'd like to do is give this question a go. Um, so we're going to go over to threats. Here we go. So hopefully on the screen, you can see which of these do you think represents the greatest threat? So one single choice, the greatest threat to squid and other ocean invertebrates. So there's a whole bunch of threats that many marine species face, everything from climate change to fishing, invasive species and um, vessels, offshore development could be like winds, wave energy and pollution, of course, as well. So perhaps what you think is the greatest, it's really difficult. We know that to be honest, it's often cumulative impacts um, that cause the biggest problems. It's when these threats intersect and it's very, very difficult to um, to understand even what, you know, what is causing what impact. Um, OK, the bars have stopped. Mm, yeah, no, they've stopped moving now. They've stopped moving. I thought it'd be really nice to introduce this question before handing over to Jess uh, to talk a bit more about some of the conservation work um, that the Trust is involved in and things like that. So let's end the poll there. Yep. Looks like it stopped moving and you can all see the results. So it looks like most people believe fishing and aquaculture um, to be the biggest threat, um, followed by invasive species and climate change. So I'll hand over to you, Jess. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Eloise. I'll just share my screen now. Yeah, can you see my screen all okay? Yes, we can. All right. So uh, the Scottish Wildlife Trust's uh, Living Seas team uh, is kind of a group of three of us. Um, and we focus on two key areas of work. Um, so we have uh, policy and we also have community engagement. Um, so in the policy and advocacy work, we work very closely with the government, industry, other academics, uh, key stakeholders, um, like the public, and we ensure that marine ecosystem health is a priority in all of our decision making. Um, and then in community engagement, we're kind of trying to uh, show all of the work that we're doing um, and get it out there to um, the to the general public. Um, so if you look at our website, you can find all of the policy documents um, and we have split them into different areas. So we have offshore renewables, ecosystem-based fisheries management, um, aquaculture, um, and then you can see how all of the policy work um, goes in. Um, so with uh, invertebrates, how is Scotland protecting? Um, this group of animals, um, primarily through a lot of legislation, um, things like the Wildlife and Countryside Act, um, which puts some high protection on some critically um, endangered mollusks, such as the freshwater pearl mussel. Um, so certain species are protected by legislation. Um, and then there are also uh, UK biodiversity action plan species as well. Um, some of the species are actually priority marine features, which are habitats themselves. Um, so we have flame shell beds, blue mussel beds, horse mussel beds, and things like native oysters, which can actually form habitat for other species. Um, so these are really important and kind of turn 
tie into the marine protected areas um, network and what we're doing to protect uh, the marine environment in that way. Um, sustainable fisheries management practices also um, helps to um, preserve these species. Um, in Scotland, well, in the UK, um, you can see a nice little thing from sea fish here, um, that actually nethrops and king scallops are one of the top five um, highest volume landings in the UK. Um, and within Scotland, we actually have um, high landings and commercial fisheries in nephrops, scallops, brown crab, velvet crab and lobster. Um, and these are um, quite well managed and we um, and there's a really nice summary by Marine Scotland on how these um, fisheries are managed. Um, in terms of uh, the price um, and value of these um, particular stocks, um, as you can see, invertebrates actually um, are very valuable to the UK itself. Um, so nephrots and brown crab and king scallops and lobster are actually within the top five. Um, so it is really important to sustainably manage these uh, fisheries stocks. Um, and this is done via the International Council for Exploration of the Sea, um, which is um, kind of the international group um, that do fisheries management on these species. Um, and there is a working group on cephalopods, fisheries and life history, um, which sets out to improve knowledge about the assessment of uh, cephalopods as an exploited resource. Um, and nephrops for sure is also um, managed using a working group um, and they have individual stock assessments undertaken to make sure that this is done within sustainable limits. Um, also restoration projects going on around Scotland. Um, quite a few of our um, snorkel trail um, partners are involved in various restoration projects. Um, people like uh, the Doorknock Deep Project, Sea Wilding and Restoration Force. Um, but if you do want to know more about this, then you can have a look at our uh, dive, deep dive into Scotland's Living Seas webinar on seagrass and native oysters, which is now available on our YouTube channel. I won't go into it further. Um, the, the main thing that's protecting these species is actually the Marine Protected Areas Network. Um, and uh, Scotland and the rest of the UK has committed to 30% uh, of our seas being um, protected by 2030. Um, we have different areas and different types of marine protected areas, uh, including like special areas of con um, conservation, um, areas that are uh, protected based on um, historical um, significance, etc. but mainly it is to protect biodiversity. Um, and at the moment, um, right now, the Scottish government is asking for views on proposals uh, to give 10% of Scotland's seas the highest possible level of protection, which would be highly protected marine areas. Uh, and this stops all forms of damaging activity, um, such as uh, fishing or um, other forms of pollution. Um, and it allows for also non-damaging recreational activities uh, to go ahead. Um, in 2022, the UK government produced a Bainon review on whether areas with higher levels of protection can enable a greater recovery of the marine ecosystem. Um, and in England, they recommended five pilot studies. Um, and just today, they actually announced that three of those sites are actually going ahead. Um, so in Scotland, uh, we're a little bit behind the process and we're currently doing the consultation for having the highly protected marine areas. Um, and this is how you can take part. Um, the highly protected marine areas are not a 100% given. Um, so we would like as many people as possible to ask the environment minister to create ocean recovery zones, which will be the highly protected marine areas. Um, and I think Eloise will be posting in the chat, um, but uh, Scottish Environment Link, who we partner with, um, are trying to register people's interest in creating these ocean recovery zones. Um, so please do go along to that site. Um, your opinion really matters and we really want to get these um, as an integral part um, of protecting our seas. Um, you can 
have a look basically just a little note just to say that we do have upcoming webinars uh, the next one is going to be uh, salmon um, and then the following one after that is going to be marine mammals um, we put them all together into one collection now so please do have a look on the eventbrite page um, and we at the living seas team really like this quote that no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced um, so we like to segue this into our snorkel trail network, which, as you can see from our leaflets, does have a massive amount of invertebrates that you can go and see. And it's all around the coast of Scotland. Uh, we've got a couple of really exciting snorkel trail launches later this year. So really stay in touch with the Living Seas team because we'll be putting those out um, very soon. Um, and go and have an explore of the seas. So thank you very much for listening. And does anyone have any questions for any of the presenters? Thanks very much, Jessica. Um, yeah, so if all our speakers can just pop your cameras on again so we can see your lovely faces. And yeah, I think we'd um first off, just uh yeah, on behalf of on behalf of everyone here, just to say thank you so much um, for sharing your expertise. Um Jess and I were having a chat about this. Jess, how many how many um sort of you said squid in particular so squid is is very much sort of um jesse's area of expertise as a species but how many experts did you say there were um and in, in roughly when it comes to squid in the world graham will probably have a better idea of this or Anne marie but i'd say like 200 250 there, the point I'm trying to make is there's not many, okay? So um, I think it's just so exciting to be able to, you know, shout about our ocean invertebrates. We often forget about the small stuff and um, it's really nice to have had a bit of a profile on squid as well, which often doesn't get the attention it deserves. Um, before we kind of dive into the q and it'd be really lovely um, for perhaps Anne-Marie to, if you were happy to maybe just pop on your mic and just give us a bit of an introduction to yourself as well. Um, so um, just, to, just to kind of explain the context of, you know, how you connect with uh, Seb's for Chefs. Seb's and Chefs, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, thanks, Louise. I am um, based in Galway and I am interested in sustainable fisheries and have worked on lobster originally and um graham and i were put in touch by a, a a very good taxonomist who has actually described a new species of octopus who's a colleague of mine and because graham is also interested in um fisheries i guess and and cetaceans he has a lot of expertise in, in cetaceans we decided to write this grant together um looking at the sort of um duality that we love invertebrates, we love these squid, they're so intelligent and they're so inspiring. And yet at the same time in the south of Europe, they're just food, <laughs> you know. So um, so um, finfish stocks are under pressure, so we thought it was a nice thing to, um, to maybe look at diversifying fisheries into these in the north. So that's what the project is all about. But of course, Graham and I are very conservation minded as well and are interested in them from that point of view not overfishing them. Thank you for that, Anne-Marie. Um, yeah, I thought it would just be useful. So in case um, some of you are wondering, because Anne-Marie didn't give a presentation, but definitely fed into a lot of the content that we covered today. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm just kind of nipping over to the Q&A just now. And it does seem like a few of the questions have been uh, given some answers already. So thank you very much to all the speakers who have been uh, chipping into that. Um, I wonder um, I wonder if anyone has, if anyone has for shop, we do have till seven o'clock. So if anyone does have any further questions, please continue to add them. Um, I wonder if I can maybe even read some of these out loud um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to work your way through them yet. So we have one here um, saying, is there any data yet on the change in level of plastic since 1970? Um, so I'll read the answer and really shared, and perhaps we can kind of have a little bit of a chat about that. So uh, not sure about historical data um, regarding micro microplastics. Um, the latter research really only exploded in the 2000s. Um, but it is a good question and could be a way of using museum specimens, um, taking museum specimens of cephalopods 
from the 70s and the 80s and comparing these with contemporary samples. Um, so I suppose this really shows where each, you know, different organisations really intersect and work together. You know, we have, um, you know, we have the likes of sort of conservation based bodies and we have museum specimens being so incredibly important. We have uh, projects like CEFs and CHEFs and um, all kind of coming together to really share that expertise. But regarding plastic, I wonder if anyone else would like to um, have any input with regards to ocean plastic and how that might affect our invertebrates. Did anyone like to chip in? Um, I think I might say something here about some of the, the smaller species. Quite often when they feed a lot on um, plastics, it actually blocks up their guts and it reduces their reproductive fitness. It redu reduces the, the size they can get to. Um, and I think this may or may not be quite important for some of the crustacean um, fisheries, um, but I'm not an expert in any, in, in any means, but that is just what I understand is, is one of the problems um, relating to the ocean plastics. Yeah, just, just one additional thought. I mean, I, I saw Anne-Marie answered the question in a question and answer. Um, I mean, I, I think obviously plastics get into just about every marine organism you could you could imagine, and squid are are important as food, um, not just for ourselves but also for cetaceans. And and one thing which does seem to be happening is that um, cetaceans, which specialise in feeding on squid, um, are, are accidentally eating plastic bags, apparently, because they uh, appear to resemble squid. So, I mean, there have been cases of, of beaked whales with their stomachs full of, full of plastic bags. And it looks like, as I said, because they thought they were eating squid. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a really, a really interesting but sad fact when we consider how how many species are being impacted by ocean plastic um, and yeah it's such a growing body of research as well. I'm kind of popping over to a question that's just came through just now. Um, someone's asked, uh, Regina has asked, has the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in America, um, have they collaborated with you in coastal and marine projects? Um, I can see Anne-Marie nodding so I'll, I'll hand over to you Anne-Marie. I was I was actually going to hand that one to Graham because he knows everybody in the entire world of cephalopods. So maybe Graham could comment. Do we know someone would tell Graham at the moment in the working group, the IC's um, um, cephalopods working group? It, it, in fact, probably not. So I'm not sure I, I can answer that question. And. Um, I, ironically, my contacts in, in, in Woods Hole were through cetaceans and not through squid. <laughs> Jessica, do you? Yeah. Question. Yeah, um, there is, I don't think there is anybody per se in Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and they did used to do quite a lot of um, tank experiments with the uh, Laligo PDI. Um, but um, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, which is the US government version uh, uh, that's within Woods Hole, because it's just a giant street of marine biologists and it's really cool. And if you ever get the chance to go there, you definitely should. Um, and it's got a really nice museum and aquarium and everything as well. Um, but uh, there are some squid biologists there um, and previous to my role at the Scottish Wildlife Trust, I was working with Lisa Hendrickson, who is one of the squid biologists there. Um, so no specific collaborations between uh, kind of different institutions within Scotland and here, but still working on the, with them and collaborating with them on various projects. Um, we're still writing papers together on looking at migratory patterns in squid um, just off the east coast of America. Um, and so they are very open to collaborating with people in, in Europe. Yeah, I think that collaboration is just so important, isn't it? And um, we've also just popped our email address into the chat box. So um, just so you're aware, it's um, for the Living Seas Project, 
It's living seas at scottishwildlifetrust.org.uk. So if you feel like there's someone that you would like to, you know, if, if you do have someone you think that should be put in touch with some of the work that's going on, or you'd like to exchange information, um, please feel free to email our inbox and we can always uh, follow up with the speakers after the session and um, to even connect some dots and, and kind of spark some further discussion. So yeah, thank you for, for keeping that in mind. Um, so I wonder if actually, we've not got any questions coming in just now. Um, I had a little bit of a question, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> I was kind of thinking back about the, the, the question we asked around threats, um, threats faced. Um, and, you know, we had a little bit of talk about, you know, um, sort of fisheries and things. And um, we haven't really had a great deal of discussion. You know, we don't have a whole lot of time to get into the nitty gritty. But I was thinking about climate change in particular. And, you know, it seems to be just with plastics, a growing body of research. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're only beginning to scr scratch the surface as to climate change impacts on our oceans and on marine life. Um, I just wondered if anyone um, does have any maybe stories to tell or opinions as to how it is affecting our, our cephalopods or other ocean invertebrates. It's quite a big question, but if anyone has any any thoughts at all, feel free to share. If not, I will look that up there. <laughs> well, um, I, I would say that all of the um, fisheries assessments are now being carried out in light of climate change because the abundance is shifting and the distribution is shifting. So um, the abundance is higher in places where it used to be high and it's lower in places where it used to be higher, if you know what I mean. And um, when you looked at the threats, going back to your list of threats, I was surprised to see that noise from um, from developments in the marine space was not listed as a threat because we have seen histological damage to the 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 ear um, in in cephalopods from noise, and that's an increasing threat. So I I I would say, you know, that's an important one because they are coastal, a lot of them, and they're coming into the coast um, towards the sound, the, the, the worst of the of the noise pollution. That's yeah, I, I, sorry, I was just gonna say, I, I might just add that there was evidence in at least one of the giant squid, which was stranded on the north coast of Spain, that it's, uh, that it's uh, statisists had been damaged by a loud noise. So noise could have contributed to those strandings. Yeah, wow. I mean, it, it's just, you know, when you think that the impacts that we have, um, you think you understand the impacts we're having on, on our planet, and then you learn new information that um, can be really eye-opening, but also quite, uh, quite devastating sometimes to hear as well, the impacts. But it's really important, isn't it, that we understand what's going on um, and only by, get, you know, gaining that knowledge can we actually um, move towards sort of, you know, fixing it and finding a solution. Um, I suppose just in the last few minutes, um, maybe just a kind of a question to maybe pass around each of you. Um, if you if anyone coming along this session today um, would like to take away a message, you know, one kind of nice take home message, perhaps it might be an action, something that they can do in their day to day lives, perhaps. Um, it might be, um, you know, a way for them to learn more about um, some of the things you've talked about today. And uh, maybe we can go around everyone and you can kind of just give us your one takeaway message from today. So we'll start at the start. So, Graham, you were first. Do you have a takeaway message from today? Um, I was just thinking of one of the, the bits of the, the Kess and Chefs project policy brief, which I missed out, which was uh, um, the, the issue of um, um, fraud in, in the food chain and, and things like adding water to octopus and to increase the weight when they're sold. Uh, and I guess if there's a, a message there, it's uh, try and make sure that if you if you eat cephalopods, they come from a sustainable source and, and that, uh, that there is some sort of traceability bit behind uh, what you're eating. Okay, yeah, really good message. So yeah, making sure you know where your food comes from. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely something that I think we're all trying to keep in mind is that sustain, sustainability in the way we live. Um, it can sometimes be a challenge, but um, yeah, I think it's definitely worthwhile. Um, thank you, Graham. Um, so I wonder who wants to go next. Will we go over to Sankari? Do you um, have any takeaway message for us? 
Uh, yes, I think everybody could do with being an ambassador for invertebrates. There's so much um, emphasis on the, the big eyed megafauna, the charismatic megafauna, and they are tiny compared to the importance of the invertebrates. Please go out there, just champion invertebrates every which way. That's mine. Thank you. That's a great message. Thank you. Um, and Jessica, I wonder if we'll hop over to you. Do you have any thoughts? Maybe that one webinar is not enough uh, for all of the cool stuff that's going on with the invertebrates, basically. We might we might need to do a whole series just on this one group of uh, animals alone, really. Um, and probably just to try and keep eating as much of a variety of seafood as possible, rather than just uh, relying on the, the, you know, tins of tuna and the cod that you usually get. Um, it's It's... I don't know, very nice to just branch out and make it as varied as possible to put the, the strain on, like put less strain on the, the main uh, fishery species that we're used to eating in the UK. Absolutely true. I mean, I remember I was reading a paper just this week and it was talking about an audit on fish stocks in Scotland. And it said of the top 10 species, six out of 10 of them are overfished. Um, and uh, exploited in an unsustainable way. Only th one of them was data deficient. Only three species in the top 10 um, were considered sustainably sourced um, stocks in Scottish waters. Um, so yeah, it's incredible the impact we're having. Um, and Anne-Marie, I wonder if you can uh, share a takeaway message from the session today. Yeah, so I agree uh, that we need to broaden our diet. And if you want to find sustainable or if you want to find out more information about what is sustainable, go straight to the horse's mouth and download the stock book. And you can go to every single area in the whole of the ICES um, area, which is all of the Atlantic, um, European Atlantic, and you can check whether your stock is overfished or not. And, and you can ask your fishmonger where the fish comes from. Yes, yeah, so that information is publicly available. I think yes. maybe a lot of people don't know that, right? So yeah, that's a really important point to share. Thank you. Um, well, listen, we've just reached uh, a minute past seven. So um, just to again, thank you so much for coming along. Um, if you would like to join one of our next webinars, we have two left in the series. We've got next week, we've got salmon. And then the final webinar is marine mammals. So we hope to see you again and take care and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. So I'm just going to stay on the call. If, it, if the speakers, if you're if you would like to, to leave, then please do. Thank you so much for your time and we can follow up later. If you would like to stay on the call for a few minutes or to, to have any chats, feel free to do that too. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I'm just going to turn off the record now, everybody. Okay. <laughs>